We should be familiar with the gross anatomy of the heart, correct? As far as the chambers, um, y'all should be familiar with the circulation of the heart. The cardiac cycle. Remember the way the blood goes to the lungs, comes back and all that. So if you have that knowledge in your head, uh, we're just today looking at the circulatory or circulation or the arteries of the heart itself. The heart is like any other organ in your body. It needs blood flow, it needs oxygen, it needs nutrients. So whenever there is a lack of a shortage of that, it will send signals. When you mash your finger somewhere with a door, you get a signal to your head of pain, right? Right away, the nerves send a signal and it's telling you that your finger hurts or your heart has uh, similar systems to let you know that something is hurting, if there's a lack of oxygen. What uh, is the term that is used to describe a lack of oxygen or lack of nutrients, lack of blood flow to the muscle? It starts with the letter I. Ischemia. Ischemia is correct. Very good. Ischemia is the word we use to describe that, the lack of blood flow to a part of the heart. And then when there is death, tissue death, what do we call that? Tissue. And it starts with another I. Infarct. I N F A R C T. Infarct. So if the tissue dies, that means it's infarcted. You might have heard, I know it sounds like a, something else. But if you might have heard that some people had a, in Spanish, call it un infarto. You guys ever heard that? Mm -hmm. right? Oh, le un infarto. What does that mean? Well, people think it's a stroke. Right? Well, a stroke is one thing, and then the tissue that dies is the infarct, okay? The stroke might have been caused by um, a blood clot. It might have been caused by hemorrhage in the brain or something else, right? Or even head trauma. But when the tissue dies, now they had an infarct. That means that part of the brain is dead. It's not going to work. That means you will not function normally as you work. Same thing in your heart. If any tissue in the heart dies, it's not going to work the same, obviously, right? You... Now that you know the knowledge of the electricity and how it flows, you know it's gonna mess up the electrical conduction and which equals the contraction, right? Systole and diastole of the heart is gonna be affected considerably. So that's why we have to know a little bit about the anatomy or the circulation, the circulatory system of the heart itself. Why? There's only, we only focus on the main arteries, the main branches, okay? So you see the big ones, right? You the aorta, okay? And it divides into the left and the right um, arteries and then the, the veins. Everywhere there's an artery, there's a vein, okay? So you have your superior, inferior, and venic cavus and all that. The aorta is the largest artery in your body, okay? Uh, and then what is uh, special about arteries? What is... um very distinctive about arteries. Why do they make them so special? And how can they be ruined over time? Well, arteries are composed of three layers, right? We have the, the lumen, which is the very inside opening, right, of the, where the blood flows through. And then you have valves, but valves you only find in veins. Valves are not in arteries, only in the veins, okay? Because what happens is that the, when the blood is coming back to the heart through the veins, the valves help as a as stop the backflow so it doesn't go back down, right? Because coming down from the body up, if the heart is not strong enough to push it, it, just, it will just go back down through gravity, right? So it has these valves to help us push it up. And that's why they're located superficially close to the muscles so that our own muscles, when they move, can help push the blood back up. And then the heart and all that. So that's why they're like that. So arteries are a little bit different. They have an endothelium. Or they call it a tunica, intima. Intima is inside, right? Something very personal, something intimate is very deep inside, right? So they call it the tunica intima. Followed by connective tissue, connects it to the next layer, the tunica media. That's more muscle tissue, more fibrous tissue. And it's expandable, it stretches. And lastly, your tunica adventitia. So you see all these three layers are there for a reason. 
it helps the arteries stay intact, first of all, but they're also stretchy. So when your heart pumps the blood, right, systole, push the blood up, the arteries do this, expand and contract, expand and contract, all right? So that is the main part or job of the arteries, to expand, to accommodate the blood pressure, and then relax, you know, relax, I'm sorry, relax is opening, uh, or dilate, we say dilate, and then constrict back to its normal state. So where, what is the problem with that? Well, over time, so a person has disease like hypertension, high blood pressure. After many years that this person is, has high blood pressure, the arteries are doing this, stretching and stretching and stretching, and so is the heart, right? Stretching and contracting, stretching, contracting. Well, the arteries over a long period of time lose their elasticity elasticity. So they no longer stretch. So what happens when they stay stiff? We call it atherostenosis. It's one of the terms I think in here or the first chapter. Atherostenosis, hardening of the arterial walls. Now what happening, what makes your arteries stiffen? Smoke. Smoking makes your arteries stiffen. Okay. So as a result, when they are stiff and they don't stretch anymore, the heart thinks there's more resistance. There's more resistance. So the heart does what? it pumps harder, it pumps harder. That's one problem. What is another problem? That the lumen starts to narrow. Why does the lumen narrow? Why does it get closer or, or, or less narrow? Why does it start to close up? What do y'all think? Some people say cholesterol right away. Cholesterol. Well, is it cholesterol? It is cholesterol, but what makes it cholesterol? The sugar. The sugar. The sugar makes the cholesterol. Three sugars make one cholesterol. Okay? All that extra sugar that we eat is stored in your liver, and your liver makes more sugar. Right? Why? So it thinks that whenever you have a bad day, like starve, which we never do, uh, it, it stores it, right? And then even your, your liver gets fatty. You guys have heard of fatty liver now, right? It's a big problem right now. People have, a lot of young people have fatty livers, like you, young, like young, like you, I mean, <laughs> not that you have enough. Young people have it. I have coworkers that have fatty liver. I have family members that have fatty liver, right? So it happens because we eat too much sugar. So where does all that extra sugar or cholesterol build up? in between the walls, between the, the intima and the adventitia. So the extra uh, fat starts to push down on the, on the lumen, so it narrows. What's the problem with that? There's decreased blood flow going to that part of the, the muscle. Wherever it's going to, it's decreased blood flow. So your heart's gonna feel it. You're gonna start to feel shorter breath. You, before you could cut the yard, mow the lawn, like no problem, right? You could do all these chores without any <sighs> shortness of breath. And now you're like, oh my God, yeah. I need to exercise. It could be that lack of exercise, or it could be that something is going on in the arteries of the heart. This is not the, the electri electricity. We're talking about the blood flow, right? So now why do we have to know that? Because when you look at an EKG and you see changes in a particular lead, you're gonna know, oh, this guy's having um, uh, ischemia in the left anterior descending, right? The artery that feeds the left wall, the left ventricle, which is the most common one. Or this person, if you look at, you know, maybe uh, AVR or V1 or um, lead three, and you see changes in those leads, like, oh, probably the right uh, anterior descending, right? The artery that feeds the right ventricle and the right atrium, right? Or the right main, so you can tell, that's why it, it teaches you this, so that, you know, just by looking at an EKG, you can tell where the problem is. Well, the doctors can tell pretty much because with experience, they see all these problems, right? They see so many people that are like, okay, they already know which arteries are going to be clogged. So where do they have to go? To the cath lab, to the cath lab, okay? So the main ones that we need to know are the, the right coronary artery, which branches off the aorta. They branch off the aorta and goes right between the right atrium and the right ventricle. It's kind of a escondida. It's like hidden in there. And then it goes down to the right, uh, to the right marginal, 
the right margin of branches off the right coronary artery and it feeds that right side of the heart. And then to feed the back side of the right side, you have your posterior descending artery. Posterior means the back side, right? Posterior, posterior. And descending means going down, posterior descending artery. So those two are the main ones that feed the right side of the heart, the front and the back. On the opposite side, on your left side, you have your left, left artery, right? The left coronary artery, left coronary artery. These are the main ones that usually get uh, fixed, right? With a stent, as I was talking about that yesterday. If you need a stent, it's gonna be one of these arteries, the main ones, the main branches. You have your uh, left uh, anterior descending artery, which feeds the left ventricle and the, the great cardiac, uh, well, you have a vein there as well. And to go back to the back side of the heart, you have your circumflex. The circumflex takes blood to the back side of the heart, right? It goes around and it branches off into to, uh, the obtuse marginal artery, which is the one that descends. It goes down and feeds the posterior lower part of the ventricle, the left ventricle. So the rest of them obviously get smaller and smaller, but the main ones are the ones that usually get fixed with stents uh, or some other kind of uh, treatment. Those are the ones that usually tend to, or the ones that are uh, uh, fixable, because if they get smaller than that, they, they you can't, it's very difficult to, to fix them. And some people will have more than one artery that is usually occluded. When do you get a bypass? They will require bypass, heart bypass. Usually it has to be uh, more than two arteries and or three, and they have to be more than 80% occluded. Like the lumen has to be more than 80% occluded. Casi toda, it almost has to be completely closed. So the, uh, the person that suffers a, a uh, symptoms of a heart attack are gonna be different. Women are less likely to feel symptoms of a heart attack. So it's really important that you know your body, that you listen to your body, pay attention to it. If we don't, then you're never gonna recognize it. And that's what happens to most people. They don't listen to their body, right? Uh, or we just kind of like, eh, right? Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. So yesterday I had a, a resident complaining of chest pain in the during the daytime. So when I got there, the nurse told me, it's like, uh, okay. So the later the resident complained again of tightness in his chest. And uh, I asked him, is it chest pain? And he didn't want to tell me chest pain because he didn't want to go to the hospital. And anyway, so luckily the physician was there, the doctor was there and he, um, he went in there and, and checked him out. And uh, he told him, well, you have to go to the emergency room. He says, well, no, I, I'm not gonna do that. Like, well, why not? Uh, because I don't want to go through the hassle of going through quarantine when he comes back and all that. It's like, really? Like, say, if I die, I die. I'm DNR. So he was pretty conf you know, pretty sure about, it. he didn't really care if he died or not. So anyways, uh, he ended up staying and uh, uh, we did some workups in the x-ray and turned out to be a little bit of bronchitis. At least that's what the doctor said. So we gave him nebulizers, antibiotics and an x-ray which turned out to be normal. Um, so hopefully he gets better. But, um, Anyways, how the average person waits three hours before seeking help, three hours before going to the emergency room. And all this time, the heart has been going on without, without, any, without any blood flow or decreased blood flow. 10 million, 200,000 people in the US suffer from angina. What is angina? An oppressive pain or pressure in the chest, right? When the arteries all of a sudden constrict, the arteries in your heart, they constrict, there's decreased blood flow to the heart, your heart starts to panic. It starts to pump really, really hard and you feel the palpitation. You feel like it wants to beat out of your chest, right? And if you're short of breath and get anxious and you get scared, you feel like you're gonna die because you can die. That's angina. Not to be confused with anxiety. Anxiety is a bit different. The main difference is usually the age. If you tell me, oh my, my heart is gonna beat out of my chest and this and that, I'm like, okay, settle down, slap you a couple of times and then it goes away. 
But older people, if they complain of this, obviously you know, it could be a, you know, angina or it could be a heart attack. So we have to take it more seriously. Not to say that old people don't have anxiety. Believe me, they do anxiety. As a matter of fact, that resident I just talked about, I think he was, or he is having a lot of anxiety. Was it older? No, he's got advanced Parkinson's. So it's getting more difficult for him to walk around and get around and all that. So he gets a little bit anxious. So to uh, play it safe, we always consider any chest pain as possibly cardiac origin. So we send him out. Right? We don't want anybody to die uh, because, oh, well, it's probably just anxiety. It's probably just, you know, complaining. It's arthritis. Or in old people, we always think it's arthritis because they get arthritis everywhere in the ribs. So it could be, you know, pain because of the rib cage or, you know, the, whatever. So we just send them out. Symptoms of um, angina are, is a long list and not everybody gets them all. But I'm going to tell you the ones that I have seen most commonly over my years of uh, working. Obviously, a little bit shorter of breath. Sweating. Who sweats when they're sitting down? If you're sweating, sweating when you're sitting down, you got a problem. Sweating, we call it diaphoresis. Diaphoresis is a medical term for sweating. So you can use that word on your family. Oh my God, I'm so diaphoretic. <gasps> What's that? <laughs> I'm sweating. Uh, chest pain. Chest pain usually could be most commonly on the left side of the chest, but it could also happen on the right if somebody's having a right, you know, chest uh, um, heart attack. Chest or pain travels, right? Pain travels. You could be, you could have smashed your finger and the nail and it feels like your whole arm hurts, right? Because pain radiates. You're like, oh, my arm hurts. Why? Oh, yeah, I smashed my finger yesterday. So chest pain is the same. The signal travels. And it seems like your whole chest hurts, or your, your the backside, your your back hurts, or your neck, or your jaw, your arm. So people can describe chest pain differently. And I I just said women, most forty I think it's forty percent of women. It's in chapter one. Forty percent of females do not have any symptoms, so they can just right croak over and die without any symptoms. So I usually recommend that anybody over 40 male female get, you know, an EKG. We have volunteers. <laughs> so nausea, nausea is another one that I've seen a lot. If they're sweating and they're nauseated, it's probably going to be a heart attack. If, if they're the age, right? I was talking about older people. Like you guys get nauseated, like you're probably pregnant. Uh, <laughs> yeah, chest pain, I'll get anxiety, right? Unless you have history of heart disease, then I will probably say, oh yeah, let's take you to the ER. People describe the chest pain as an elephant standing on the chest. If they describe it like that, then you better rest assured it's probably the heart. Unstable angina is another problem that we see. There's angina uh, that happens, that is controlled, and they take medications for that, and uh, they don't feel the symptoms of the chest pain. But sometimes the angina is so bad, it just all of a sudden starts. So when the doctors know that this person has, we go to call it um, arterial spasms or your arteries constrict, constrict, uh, the blood pressure goes up, they feel the chest pain, all the symptoms. Uh, they usually give them a medication called nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin. You guys ever heard of nitroglycerin? No? Uh, nitroglycerin is actually used to make dynamite. You know what dynamite is, right? It's an explosive. So the in very, very small amounts, uh, nitroglycerin can actually help the arteries dilate. It dilates them, it relaxes them so that all the blood flow can return to the heart. So it comes now in various forms. It used to be a little tablet like this, very small tablet. And they put it under the tongue and it, it dissolves really quickly. And the medication goes straight into the arteries of the heart. It's absorbed and the arteries dilate and the blood pressure drops and the patient feels, ah, I can breathe better. The, the angina uh, you know, is resolved, sometimes with one tablet, sometimes two, but if it takes more than three, then the person should go to the emergency room. The only serious side effect that it has is that it will lower your blood pressure a lot and very quickly. So if your blood pressure is low and you take a medication like nitroglycerin, your blood pressure is gonna drop even more. 
All right, so you can die. That's why usually you call 911, right? In case your blood pressure does drop too far down, they can always help you bring it back up. So um, that's how unstable angina is treated. Why is uh, chest pain initially treated as cardiac in origin? Why? Why is it initially treated? It's on the safety and infection control box you see on page 310. You can look for the answer there, you can read it. So in, in other words, you have to err on the safe side, right? Rule out chest pain, EKG, cardiac enzymes. If everything's normal, then phew, it was not chest, you know, your cardiac pain. Signs of unstable angina. Uh, the change in severity and frequency, it happens more and more often. Now, if persons are having this type of pain, you, you likely they are going to be experiencing a heart attack very soon. It's a sign. It's like a red flag. It occurs with less exertion. It occurs more often and it lasts longer. And sometimes it does not respond to the nitroglycerin. Usually they have to go into the cath lab for some kind of treatment. Women, there it is. Oh, 40% of women having a heart attack never experienced chest pain. That's scary. Cardiac symptoms are less predictable in women than men. Men are more likely to uh, show uh, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, back or jaw pain. I had a, um, a man, I was working in this company here in McAllen in an agency. And all of a sudden, the, the owner comes in and said, can you check out my uncle? I was there in the office, like, sure, bring him in. So he was like a handyman, right, in the building. So he came in here, have a seat. I was going to wait for him to relax so he can check his blood pressure, right? When I saw him, he was, like, sweating, like, a lot. Like, were you outside? No, he estaba dentro. Like, okay. So sit down. And then I was check, got the blood pressure cup, and I checked his blood pressure. And... The blood pressure was like, I don't know, 190 or 200 or something. So it was very high, very high. So he was starting to get a little anxious. And I told him just to go ahead and relax, you know, come down, just wait here a minute. And uh, so we went to talk to the, the niece. I need to call the ambulance, right? Or take him to the emergency room, the nearest one. So they did. They took him to the farthest one. The farthest? <laughs> I said nearest, not farthest. Why? Because they took McCall Medical because uh, I think, I want to say, but it could have been because of insurance reasons. Could be, you know, people are scared, like, no personal you know, insurance. So anyways, he didn't make it to the hospital. He had a heart attack in the, in the vehicle. And he started, of course, like they start like a foaming at the mouth or vomiting or something like stuff comes out and they look gray. Remember the signs of decreased cardiac output, huh? Like discharge when you know. Yeah, because yeah, he already like, he was already like gone pretty much. Like he had, I think he had a massive heart attack. This person did smoke, okay? Aside from everything else. I don't know, I didn't know any history on him, right? I just, so anyways, unfortunately he didn't make it. He died en route to the hospital. It was sad. Anyways, it happens, you know, this person, we were, and he was like a strong, strong, hardworking man, you know? He looked real strong. Mexican man, but obviously life caught up with him. Okay, whatever lifestyle he had before, maybe he used to smoke. You know, he wasn't the picture of health either, but he wasn't like super big or anything like that. Anyways, diabetes. Diabetes is one of the big factors now because diabetes in the long run over many years affects your nerves. The nerves that tell you when you have pain so you've heard of people getting amputations, right? Because they got an infection in the toe, heart an infection, well, because they had a stone in the shoe or something, had a little ulcer. Oh, they didn't see it? No, they didn't see it. They never knew it was there. You know, like two weeks later, they got a big ulcer with an infection. Well, that infection goes to the bone and then they got to amputate it. So, so diabetes can do a number on you. It affects all your body systems, including your vision, including your heart, right? The arteries, remember the arteries, the nerves. So diabetes uh, will not allow people to feel the symptoms 
of a heart attack. So that's another problem. And it, of course, uh, uh, accelerates heart disease. It makes it go faster. So your arteries are going to get clogged with, with sugar cholesterol, triglycerides. So I see a lot of problem with uh, triglycerides. Triglycerides, if you ever check your blood, uh, do blood work on yourself, uh, look for your triglyceride levels. Those are the ones that tell you how much sugar you're eating. If they're high above normal parameters, then you're eating too much sugar, okay? Too much sugar means breads and, and pastas and anything that is made with flour or sweets, chips, junk food. All that accumulates in your body, in your liver, stores and all that. So anyhow, uh, check your, your blood work once in a while. So diabetes causes a neuropathy, right? Or, or disease in your, in, your, uh, in your nerves. Elderly patients, elderly patients, 50% of the elderly patients with an acute coronary syndrome reported atypical symptoms, including shortness of breath. What's the term for shortness of breath? The medical term. You guys recall that term? Dyspnea, dyspnea. That's the medical term for shortness of breath. Uh, so elderly people show uh, dyspnea, nausea, profuse sweating or diaphoresis, pain in the arms and fainting. So chest pain, not so much. Again, because as we get older, the nerves do not feel the same. They do not work the same. Nothing works the same. So they don't show the same symptoms as a young person. Which of the following patient groups present atypical or atypically, A or B? Which of those patients? Like they don't show the normal symptoms. Is it A or B? B, of course, right? Diabetes or diabetics, women and elderly individuals. And why are they considered atypical? Well, because they don't show the same, the same symptoms or the typical symptoms of, of a heart attack. A lot of people that have heart disease usually experience a problem called acute coronary syndrome. So acute means like a sudden onset, right? It starts like right now. Syndrome is a group of symptoms. A syndrome is a group of symptoms, so it's more than one. And of course, coronary refers to the to the heart. So <clears throat> a 12 EKG is obtained or the cardiac monitor is attached to the patient with complaints it may provide evidence of acute coronary syndrome. So what is acute coronary syndrome? So you're gonna see these signs. Uh, ST segment elevation, which uh, we haven't talked about. I mentioned it right in the past, but you might not know exactly what it is. Uh, ST elevation or no ST elevation. People can still have a heart attack with or without ST elevation. Remember the QRS and then the, the S should be under the uh, isometric line, and then that goes back up and you have your T wave. When you see the, the R and then it comes back down and then it forms like a little chair. I think I talked about it. I called it a what? A tombstone. You remember that? That is ST elevation. Or sometimes there's no ST elevation. Sometimes there's ST depression. It's, it's below the isometric line. So we'll look at that in just a bit. So according to the uh, American College of Cardiology, between 75 to 80% of patients with heart attacks with, um, with STMI, that is your classic, your ST elevation, myocardial infarction. That's what STEMI means. ST elevation, myocardial infarction. So most people that have a heart attack are gonna show that and you're gonna see it. Why does it happen? because there's complete occlusion of an artery. When the artery is completely closed, you're gonna see ST elevation. That's what you're gonna see. Schemia delays repolarization, refilling, resting, right? It delays it. So the taller the ST elevation, Probably the more severe, the more delayed repolarization is. So that's a big problem. The changes in the EKG tracing include ST segment depression or elevation, T wave inversion, 
and development of a pathologic Q wave. You have your P, atrial depolarization, and then you have your PR interval, and then you have a little needle notch, right? That is your Q wave. Your Q wave should be very, very small. And then it goes R, and it comes back S, and then T. So a, a, a pathological Q wave is a Q wave that is 50% um, or more of your R wave. 50% or more of your R wave. So when you see a pathological or a deep Q wave, you have to measure it. You're going to have to measure it. You're going to have to calculate it. Um, luckily, it's not very often that it happens, but if you see it, you have to measure it. 20 to 25% of heart attack patients do not have ST segment elevation. Why does ST not NSTMI occur? Because of an incomplete occlusion of a coronary artery. So it's a little bit, a little bit occluded, no ST elevation. They also refer to it as a silent, a silent heart attack. Because they cannot feel it. And a lot of people do have it. The, on the EKG, you can see um, old infarct. It'll say on the paper, it doesn't say old infarct uh, or infarct of, um, I don't know what it says, the word, uh, like it's an old date. It'll tell you why. Because you're going to see a significant Q wave on one of the leads, depending where the heart attack was. Yeah. And people say, like, I never felt anything. So they had a silent heart attack. And a lot of people do have them, they just don't know. And so of course, who wants to know, right? <laughs> well, it is because you already have one, it means you're probably gonna have another one. So yeah, you need like a stent or you need something, right? Maybe an aspirin at least, take an aspirin on a daily basis. I'm pretty sure. They recommend it for people, right? 40 and over, take an aspirin a day. Just to make sure. In case, you know what aspirin does, right? Aspirin is, um, it's an uh, assault, it's a little acidic. And it makes your, your blood uh, not form blood clots so quickly. So if there is any blood clots in your brain, I mean, in your... Huh? It makes the blood flow more. Yeah. And it flows because it becomes, they say, thinner. It doesn't necessarily become thinner. It just doesn't form blood clots. That's easy. Like if you get a cut in your aspirin, you're going to bleed a little bit more because it, it's going to take longer for it to form blood clots. Like if there's any injury inside your body, your blood is going to send rushed blood to start to fix it and that forms blood clots so if you have a damage in your heart what is your body, your body going to do go repair it it starts to form little plugs and you don't want plugs when an area where there's already occlusion right so that's why an aspirin kind of helps that way very all right so well, when discussing STI and STMI, it's important to realize that although these patients present quite differently, they are each risk for sudden cardiac arrest. So you know what cardiac arrest is, right? Complete stoppage of the heart, no more electrical activity, no more systole, no more asystole. That is when you need CPR. So let's look at the image here on figure 13.3. I don't know if you have to rotate it in your book. All right, um, so what are the things that we have to look for? Uh, ST elevation, right? Pathological Q waves or T wave inversion. So let's look at lead one. Now this is very small, okay? You look at lead one, it's very, very small. Uh, it's really hard to tell. Let's look at each other one. Let's look at lead two. Lead two looks pretty normal, right? Remember lead two looks at the heart from a left lower perspective. So your left ventricle seems to be okay. Lead three, okay. Um, and then let's see, let's look at AVR. AVR is normal. AVL, it looks, uh, it's normal. Uh, AVF, the lower part of your heart. And then you go to the chest leads, V1. V1 should be completely positive. Okay, if you remember what V1 normal should look like, it should not have a deflection like that. So you see when the, the V1 starts, there's a little P wave and there's um, 
the little R, it's a very small one. And then you have that big pico there. That is your S, that's called a deep S. So that, that, that's already a red flag. You look at V2 and it gets longer, right? It gets longer and then V4, V3, it's a little shorter, but what is what else do you see on V2? Yes, what, what is it? What do we call it? Yes, what is wrong with the S and the T? There's kind of, what, what's the word? Elevated, ST elevation, right? ST elevation. So if you continue on V3, it continues, it looks like a little chair or something, right? V3, so V3 should not look like that. Oh, none, none of the chest leads. So remember the chest leads look right in the interior wall, right through the heart. So if you continue on V4, now, uh, what do you see there? We call those tombstones. That is ST elevation. Because the S, the, the R wave never made it down, right? It's, and then the T, right? So the, the pico is down is your Q wave, and then it goes up and there's your R, and then the S should come back down below the asymmetric line, but no, it's way up there. And it forms like a little chair, like a little stool, right? Or tombstone, we call them. And then it comes back down and your T wave, where's, how is your T wave facing? It's inverted. That's T wave inversion. So V4 looks more at what? This part of the heart, right? So you have V1 on your right, right on the right sternal chest border and then V2 on the left side. You have uh, four and then three. So V4 is looking almost at the left ventricle. So when you see v the chest leads go wrong, it's gonna be somewhere here, more on the left ventricle, right? Five and then six. But there the focus is where? Four, five and six, where you see the ST elevation. Why do you see ST elevation again? Why? What causes ST elevation? Not stiff. Occlusion. Tapado. Occlusion of the arteries. The one that huh? The one that yeah, we call it uh, occlusion, right? It doesn't shrink, it closes because of excessive plaque, right? So it closes and there's lack of blood flow to that part of the heart. So then what happens in the AKG? What happens to the electricity that's coming down here? It gets diverted, right? We said that ST elevation represents, or the T wave represents repolarization, right? Relaxing of the heart. When this case, repolar repolarization is delayed because there's no blood flow. So you see the ST elevation, okay? ST elevation is caused by occlusion which causes the, the, the heart to, the repolarization to be prolonged. So you see this little lines above the isometric line, okay? Very, very important that you remember that. And this is your classic heart attack. So you look in, what arteries might be occluded? Which arteries? If this part of your heart is dying, the left what? The left coronary artery, and then most it could you can actually go down to the next artery level. If you look at the at the picture on the other page, which artery? The left and anterior descending or it's got another name, I forget the name. The one that feeds the lower part of the heart. So you can even the, the so now the doctor is okay, yeah. It could be the left anterior, most commonly one of those left arteries because the change in the AKG tell you that it's one of the chest leads. Well, not just one, but several. So this is why you have to be familiar with the coronary arteries and the EKG, it tells you. So without even actually looking at an X-ray of the heart, you can already tell by looking at the EKG where the damage is getting done, right? Most, more likely, 
somewhere in the left anterior descending arteries. That's where the occlusion is. Does it make sense? Yes or no? So the ST, where's the ST segment elevation and which leads? There's more than one. Come on, ladies, tell me. Where, where do you see the ST elevation? Where does it start? B2 and? B2 through what? Where do you see all the ST elevation? Through V6 is correct. All those leads show that there's a decrease in blood flow to that tissue. That's why you see the ST elevation. So something's occluded down there. So it may not just be just one part of the heart. It could be a lot more, right? Considering that's all those leads, maybe V6 is over here. So maybe you have occlusion over here too. So you, you can be looking at a massive heart attack, depending on the damage. So, so the EKG will help the doctor, the cardiologist decide this guy needs a stent or this guy needs a bypass surgery. Rush into the cath lab, do the x-ray, and it'll tell him exactly or her which arteries are occluded and decide if they need a bypass graft. My patient's son the other day had a, a bypass, a quintuplet. Quintuplet means what? How many is that? Double, triple, quadruple, quintuplet. Five. Five arteries were clogged. A, a bypass graft will extend your life for another 15 to 20 years, depending how well you take care of yourself. And what was the word that you said? Quintuplet. That's five, right? Like a girl has quintuplets, right? <laughs> Look it up. Correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. So heart disease, big problem, big, big problem. We have, we eat too much, guys. We eat too much. We drink too much. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of the men that drink a lot of alcohol, uh, it's not the alcohol, it's the yeast, all right? The beer is made from wheat, right? It has a lot of sugar. So you're not just drinking the water and making, getting drunk with the alcohol, you're drinking sugar. It's almost like drinking a Coke or Cokes or soda pops, right? Mm -hmm. Or sugar. They have like 30 grams of sugar. 30 grams is a lot. Would you eat 30 grams of sugar just like that? Probably not, right? <laughs> you know, because you want that fizz. You want that. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, the next um, topic that we need to cover is one that is way too common. It's cardiac, uh, heart failure, I'm sorry, heart failure. I think I've beat that horse quite a bit, right? I've talked about heart failure a lot. So you need to understand what it is because you see it. When you see people now, ladies, when you see people, you're going to see heart failure. You're not going to see people. You're going to see heart failure, all right? Because you're going to recognize it by the signs of, of heart failure. I told you about the story of the late, one of my coworkers, an older lady. I think she said she's 64. But she's real strong, real hard worker. Uh, her husband also works in somewhere in the oil fields somewhere, and showed me a picture of his legs. Did I tell you that story? Mm -hmm. No, this was last week. He showed me a picture like, "A ver, Javier, este, mire las piernas a mi esposo." Digo, ay, ni un ni un cafecito ni nada. So I said, "Tiene fotos, sí." So the guy's not here, right? He's somewhere up there. I don't know where. Showed me the picture of the legs like this. Like you can see them, they're swollen because they're they're shiny, and you can see they're swollen, right? Usually, most guy people have skinny legs, right? Chicken legs. I did edema. I think so. Edema, yeah, edema is a medical term for swelling, right? So super edematous, a lot of edema, and I ask him, well, what's his medical history? No, pues no tiene nada, Leo. <laughs> I think he has a lot of problems. He just doesn't, you know, Mexican, typical Mexican people, they don't want to go to the doctor because they don't want to know what they have. Or if they go, no, hombre, me sacaron todo lo que no tenía, ya sabía. Just, you know, they start 
I'm playing was you never been to the doctor, bro? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> at least once in a lifetime go. But uh, so he's supposed to go this coming Friday or Saturday. His, his wife is going to not force him, but help him, like accompany him to the doctor because uh, obviously he doesn't want to go. He's been back and forth about going and going. And shit, you know, he doesn't want to go. Anyways, so I suspect that he has heart failure. He drinks a lot. And I'm pretty sure he smokes too, but I don't know that history. Anyways, there's two kinds of heart failure, right? Uh, well, three kinds. We have left heart failure, right heart failure, and then we have a combination of left and right heart failure. So the most common cause of pump failure is myocardial infarction. What is myocardial infarction? Yes, heart attack. So if your muscle, right, let's say this muscle works fine, you work out and everything, and one day you get injured, like a serious injury, like, I don't know, like you get shot or you get a laceration, you have to get sutured and stuff, you know, to the point where you're, you're not going to be using that for a while. You think that muscle is going to be 100% like it was before? Yeah. No. No, same thing for your heart. If you have a heart attack, even if it's a small one, it's not going to work the same. Obviously, people have a lot, quite a bit of damage when they have a heart attack. They may have a one, two, three, four, you know, five vessels that are occluded, and they have a big heart attack. Uh, that muscle is not going to work the same anymore. So they have developed heart failure over time. Usually, they already have high blood pressure as it is, right? So your left, your left ventricle the muscle of the myocardium is working over time with hypertension. Oh, boom, compress, right? Stretching and compression to get that blood flow all to all the body because your arteries are constricted or stenosed, they're stiff. And your heart's like, boom, boom, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna do it somehow or another. That heart's gonna make it. It's gonna, and you, and you have a headache. People have complaining headaches a lot, right? Because there's too much pressure here to the head. So people get headaches. It looks like quita, it goes away. And then, yeah, next next day, next day. And years go by, and they never treat their hypertension. Never. Never went to the doctor, never did anything about it. So this poor heart, this poor left ventricle will get enlarged. It grows. But isn't bigger better? And people say, isn't bigger better? No, not necessarily. Why? Because inside your heart, you have your, your ventricle, the little you know, the little storage room where your blood is supposed to store and then pump it to the body. Well, when your heart grows, it just doesn't grow outward. It also grows inward. So the myocardium, you can see the picture on 317, it's going to make that the ventricle narrow. That space is going to become smaller. So what happens if that space becomes smaller? Can you conclude? What's going to happen if that left ventricle gets smaller? less right there's going to be less amount of blood in that space so when it does contract it's going to contract decrease what the magic word yes decrease cardiac output so that's what happens with heart failure and this is talking about left heart failure what are the symptoms of left heart failure it almost sounds like a heart attack shortness of breath fatigue tiredness why tired well because your muscles are not getting the blood flow you know how sometimes if you don't exercise, okay, you feel tired. Why? Because your muscles are not getting blood flow. Start walking, brisk walking, jogging, and you'll notice the difference. Your muscles are like replenished with all this blood flow. All of a sudden, you feel more energetic. As if you guys experience that, when you even exercise a little bit, oh my God, I already feel more energetic because the muscles get that never <laughs> have never received blood flow, right? Like before. Now they're getting all this blood flow, you get all this energy. So decreased blood flow will result in fatigue, tiredness. They're always feeling tired. Tachycardia, why tachycardia? Why does it race? It tries to meet the demands of the body, right? It tries to meet the demands of the body. When we're in poor physical shape, it does the same thing happens. You do something quick, like, oh, my God, right? Your heart, you can feel your heart go faster because right away it strikes to meet the demands. Same thing in heart failure. The heart is too weak. That needs to work harder and faster. 
not harder, but faster to meet the demands. Shortness of breath because your lungs obviously don't get blood flow. Confusion because your head obviously is not getting enough blood flow. Anorexia, lack of appetite. It happens a lot. It happens a lot. Your liver doesn't get enough blood flow. Your liver affects your appetite a lot. If something's wrong with your liver, you can have decreased appetite. Pallor, not enough blood flow to the skin makes you look pale. So you see what it all comes down to the heart. Right? Everything is affected when the heart does not work properly. That's left heart failure. Always leads to right heart failure. If your left fails, your right's gonna fail too. What causes again left heart failure? Heart attacks, high blood pressure, cardiac dysrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation. Remember atrial fibrillation? Those chaotic little, you know, markings on them. You see, I see the R and then that's AFib, right? All right, right ventricle failure has a different effect on the body. So we have the left, we know it pumps it to the body, right? The right does what? Pumps the blood to? Where? The right ventricle pumps the blood where? To the what? Yes, to the lungs. That's its main job pump the blood to the lungs. Where does the right ventricle get its blood from? It's deoxygenated blood. It comes from the body, right? From the lower part of the body through the inferior vena cava and the upper body through the right ven uh, superior vena cava. So that blood goes into the right atrium, then it pushed down into the right ventricle, then pushed through the right pulmonary arteries into the lungs, the right and the left lung. Remember we got two. When the right ventricle fails, less blood has been pumped into the lungs. This in turn reduces the amount of blood reaching the left ventricle. So it's kind of like a little chain reaction. Less blood flow goes out through the left to the body, then that means that there's less blood coming back to the right ventricle because there was less blood pumped out. So that means there's less blood going to the lungs. That means they're gonna be more short of breath. So it's a little chain reaction that happens. The left heart can only pump out what it receives. And this reduction in cardiac output then affects blood pressure. What happens to the blood pressure? Does it go up or does it go down? What happens to the blood pressure when there's right ventricular failure? Does the blood pressure go up or does it blood pressure go down? Down. Why down? Because there's less blood coming back to the right ventricle. Okay. You already said the, the left ventricle is so weak that it can barely pump. The, the ventricle is small. So there's less blood getting in there. So there's, that means there's less blood being pumped out, mm -hmm. right? Less blood being pumped out. So the systolic, which is your left ventricle or both ventricles contracting, right? Can be within normal sometimes, or it can be low. So less blood goes out, less blood comes back in into the right ventricle. That is going to cause a decrease in blood pressure. They call it hypotension. All right, so it's kind of like a little cycle. So what happens to that extra fluid? <laughs> it seeps out of the circulation. The arteries uh, and veins, they're what we call permeable. Permeable. That means that fluid is able to go in and out, go in and out. Right? So when you are drinking a lot of water, right? You like to drink a lot of water. Uh, what happens to the, to the excess amount? We have about five liters, right? In the bloodstream on average. And you drink another liter. Or well, is it just gonna stay there? No, your kidneys are gonna balance it out, right? They're gonna make you go pee. Well, when people have heart failure, remember the decreased pumping action of the, of the heart does not deliver that fluid to the kidneys. So the kidneys are not able to eliminate it. So where does it stay? In the circulation and your arteries. What that causes, your blood pressure to go up. But after a long period of time, your heart says, no, your circulation says, I can't handle any more fluid, right? So all that extra fluid starts to seep out of your arteries and it goes to your, usually you see it on the legs. You guys seen with 
people with edema, right? With a lot of swelling because it's all the extra fluid. It's all the extra fluid that is seeping out of you, usually in your legs. You also see it here. On older people, you might see like a big belly. I right? like the beer belly. It's not a beer belly. On young people, it's a fat belly. It's not a beer belly. It's a fat belly. On older people, it's usually fluid that escapes the, what they call the, the, the arteries, right? The circulation and builds up here and in the legs. Sometimes it builds up. You even see your hands and sometimes even the eyes. You see swelling, they look puffy. That's severe edema. We call that anasarca. That's a complete like fluid overload status. A-N-A-S-A-R-C-A. -A -A. You can Google that or study it and tell you there's that's edema or fluid overload. And that's what we try to prevent a lot in the hospital and the well in the nursing homes for the most part. Fluid overload, fluid balance. I guess you remember from CNA class, we talk about fluid balance. We have to measure the input and the output and all that, but edema, you know, elevating the extremities, limiting salt and all those measures. That is all so that you can help people manage their heart failure. There's a lot of things we can do, but sometimes we fail to do them. And the patients too, right? So low blood pressure is a common symptom of right ventricular failure. I have a lady like that. The ladies. She's giving up already. I don't think she's going to be around for too long. I hope she is, but not too. Anyways, uh, so another symptom that you see in the belly, that fluid, that extra fluid that you see on the belly is called ascites. Ascites. I have a patient like that too. <laughs> I have one of each. I, it's very interesting because I see them and I'm like, uh, he's got all the signs of heart failure. And they know they have heart failure. Sometimes they, they know, but they don't want to accept it. Like, they're like, uh, you do know you have heart failure, right? Well, the doctor hasn't told me. Uh, you had it for the last 30 years, right? So, you know, this man is, is, is getting to the point where he needs oxygen. Uh, I, I, I was keeping an eye on him, and then all of a sudden I, I realized that this man is, he was complaining of, he started like this. He started like, um... I feel weak, weak, he just felt weak, right? And I noticed it wasn't himself. So I got, I know that I know him, I'm like, okay, this, this is not like you. So his oxygen saturations, which is something that y'all need to know how to measure, just put a little machine that gives you a reading, right? The problem is that when you put the little device on the fingers, if they have cold hands, it's gonna give you a wrong reading. So you have to find a warm hand or warm it up and then put a device. Now there's bigger devices, professional, that actually read it with cold hands or no kind of So anyways, so his stats were like low decreasing. He used to be like 94% without oxygen. Now he's 88, 90%. Like it wouldn't go up there. And I'm like, okay. And his weakness. And then I've got my stethoscope and I listened to his lungs and he had some excess fluid. I can, you can listen to it, right? You can hear crackles. You can hear decreased lung sounds and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I did report it to the doctor and we started doing something about it. And he's got this huge belly. Like it's hard? Yeah, it is hard. It is hard, you're right, it is hard. It's distended, we call this ascites, ascites. And he's got the edema, oh my Lord, the edema is, it looks like if you poke it with like a balloon, you're gonna poke it and poof, everything's gonna blow, especially on the feet. So he had him so many medications diuretics, water pills, to make him remove the excess to help his heart. And uh, so his oxygen wasn't going up, so I had to put him on oxygen. I did put him on oxygen. Fortunately, he was uh, still there. He's actually making a comeback very slowly, but making a comeback. It's been already two or three weeks, and he's barely getting better. Gosh, I never thought he was going to get any better. So finally making a comeback um, after he kind of following, you know, my instructions, like limiting his fluid, like he used to drink a lot of fluids. And I don't know if anybody ever told him that he needs to be on a fluid restricted diet. Like he would drink a lot of water and a lot of juices, a lot of this and beer. There are a lot, yeah, near prescription, they can have to drink beer. Uh, so all this stuff, like, I think he stopped drinking beer already. And I told him like, you need to limit yourself to one and a half liters with, that includes everything. 
everything, your meals, your free water, everything. That's like one and a half of those, like all day. So, huh? No, that's nothing. Some are limited to one liter, depending on the heart failure. So the heart failure is measured by a percentage, what they call it, ejection fraction. Ejection, remember stroke volume and, and uh, um, cardiac output? Well, ejection fraction is one of those terms that measures with a, when they do the two-day echocardiogram, like an ultrasound of the heart, and that machine can actually measure how much blood is being pushed out in a percentage, right? So a normal heart, usually like yours, hopefully mine, usually pumps about 60 to 70%. There's no 100%, right? That's normal, 60 to 70% ejection fraction. These people sometimes are at 20, 30, even at 40%, they feel really bad. That's heart failure. Anything below 50 is heart failure. So 40%, 30%, of the blood is being ejected with every stroke. If you have, let's say, 500 milliliters in the in the ventricle, it, it only puts out 250 or 300. That's like, that's about 40%. So that's not enough. I mean, in the long run, you're gonna have all these problems that you see here. So last thing about right heart failure, we'll get a little break here. Right heart failure, other symptoms that you see is low blood pressure, jugular vein distension. Jugular, you call it JVD. The jugular veins, these, mm -hmm. they get distended. There is, don't confuse with the artery. The artery is the one that you palpate, right? No, the veins, if I'm standing here, my veins are my, popping out, that's a problem. Or if they lay down and the veins swell up, that means that's a problem. That's jugular vein distension. You can also see it like that. You see, um, Swelling in the ankles, feet, legs, abdomen, all that stuff. That's what he has. He's right there. And ascites, fluid collection in the abdomen, right? Fluid is going through the liver. Blood is going through the liver. But if it's not, the pressure is not enough to push it through the liver, then it will seep out into this, we call ascites. We do a test, right? I forget the name of the test is, but we get the belly, right? When somebody's like obese, like fat, and it's manteca, right? You can grab it like a like a lonja, right? The medical term for lonja is panus, um, P-A-N-N-U-S, right? That's a panus, that's a, a lonja. Um, you can grab it and it's mushy, right? It's like dough, like you're making flour tortillas, right? Well, in, in ascites, it's hard. You, you put your hand on one side of the abdomen and the, on the other side, you tap it, boom. And it's like the water goes. And you feel it over here. Really? Yes. So you tap it and you feel it's like boom. That's uh, the test we do for ascites. Okay. It happens with the heart failure. It happens with liver failure too. So anyways, let's take a quick break. And uh, we'll resume in just a bit. Okay. So we resume our conversation um, on chapter 13. Page 13, section 13.6, cardiac patient assessment and immediate treatment. So when a person is having a heart attack and an acute myocardial infarction, we have to respond. If it is, I remember we treat every chest pain as possible of cardiac origin. So we have to start the, um, the questionnaire. Now we got to ask, when did it start? What were you doing? Were you like cutting the yard? Were you were sitting down? What were you doing? Provoke, what provokes it? What makes it worse? This is one of the questions I always ask the patients. What makes it worse? Is it exertion or nothing when you breathe, when you cough? Why? Because it helps us kind of narrow down. When I ask people like, does it hurt when you breathe? I, 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 me duele. If there's pain when they breathe, usually it's not cardiac origin, right? But we're still gonna continue with the process, right? Or, ah, oh, no, it hurts all the time. So I, I palpate, right? I touch them where it tells me that it hurt, like, aquí me duele. So I pop it, like, ay, ay. Well, that's not chest pain, right? It's not cardiac. It could be muscle pain. It could be arthritic pain, right? So that to me is like, oh, okay, it's not that bad. So we, that's what we have to ask. What provokes it? Well, when does it start? Can you describe the pain? Does it feel like, a, is it sharp, like somebody's sticking you with a knife? Or is it dull, like somebody's pressing you, like a, an elephant has his leg on your, right, on your chest? What does it feel like? Does it go anywhere else? Does it go to your left arm, your neck, your back? Sometimes people don't have the chest pain here. They have it on the backside. Why? Why might people have chest, uh, pain on the on the backside of the 
on the you know on your backside left back why would they have pain there yeah why because they're having a heart attack over here right like in the example that we saw right we saw on v6 which should be about it right here there could be ischemia happening over here so the pain might be oh, maybe like or between the shoulder blades all right or if it's on this side maybe the left arm if it's up on high on the left ventricle it could be the neck or jaw pain so the symptoms could be vary depending where the heart attack is located where it's happening uh how severe is it? in a scale from zero to ten if they can understand the numerical scale sometimes the face scale will work and how long does it last how long has it been going on oh yet yeah. it's been years okay that's not cardiac pain right is it the same that's what so you have to go through the question that can help you uh pinpoint you know what type of pain they're having uh, another mnemonic, right? A mnemonic, the sample. You can use the OPQRST to help you remember the questions you have to ask or the sample, whichever one is better. The signs and symptoms you can actually see, feel, right? Whatever the patient tells you, those are signs and symptoms. Allergies, any known allergies for inpatients, medications they take, previous history, uh, the last time they ate, food or liquids, and events. Record anything that led up to the problem. What were you doing? No, because I was, I took a little jog, you know, hand jogging a long time. So we decided to go jog and all of a sudden I feel this pain. So you can use one, either one of those two to help you evaluate the patient. This is part of the assessment part of it. Immediate care. When providing care to the chest pain patients, it's necessary to that medical care to be delivered immediately and effectively. That's why when you go to the ER and say chest pain, you go to the front of the line. Time is muscle. The longer the person is experiencing the symptoms, the longer that muscle uh, uh, is going without oxygen and nutrients and it's dying. So the more muscle dies, the more damage. So we got to act right away. And then like the heart is more sensitive? Well, if you're sensitive, any decrease in blood flow, you're going to get the sign of chest pain. Okay, you're going to get it. Um, American Heart Association guidelines is their list of tasks to be performed within 10 minutes of the patient's arrival. This is in the ER and it's on page 321. It says the pain level, okay. The quality, duration, location, and all that, kind of with the OPQRST I just said. The vital signs, what are the vital signs? The blood pressure. A lot of times the blood pressure would be a little bit elevated if they're anxious or be within normal. But the, uh, the pulse may be fast, the oxygen saturation may be low. Why would the saturation would be low? Why would it be low? Oxygen saturation, why would it, why would it be low? Because the heart is pumping less blood to the lungs. That means there's less oxygenated blood coming back to the left ventricle. That means there's less oxygenated blood going to all your body. So your oxygen level is gonna be low. <laughs> Are the respirations regular or in a pattern? Start oxygen. We do. We have an acronym called MONA. Remember the MONA, Lisa? MONA. We give these people morphine. Morphine helps the person relax so they're not anxious, so they don't aggravate the problem. Oxygen, to give supplemental oxygen in case their O2 sats are low, oxygen. They give them nitroglycerin Nitroglycerin, remember the one I spoke about earlier? Dynamite? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As long as systolic blood pressure is greater than 100 millimeters of mercury, because it will drop your blood pressure and you will end up dying from low blood pressure, right? So it has to be above 100. That's why you have your vital signs. So it comes in a tablet or a spray nowadays. It goes under the lung. It's called sublingual. Sub under lingual is lung lingua under the tongue. A systolic BP of less than 100 is an indicator of hypotension. So a person has hypotension, they might have right ventricular heart failure. Right away, we got to start um, an IV line. That's how we uh, are able to increase the blood pressure by giving more fluids, more adding more volume to the circulation. We can increase blood pressure. Why is blood pressure so important? Why is blood pressure so important? Why do you think it's important? Because it 
your blood uh, your heart keeps the blood pressure going but why is it so important there's a word called perfusion perfusion p e r f u s i o n it's very important that you know this word because all your organs need perfusion right for example how does the water make it to your house i think i went over this example before right when you talk about blood pressure and cna how does the water make it to your house i don't know i just open it and it comes out it gushes out right it didn't just like trickle out it gushes out right why because there's what what would you call it water pressure right mm-hmm. well how how is your water pressure where is the water coming from i don't know but it gets here that's all that matters <laughs> you see those big towers right the water towers in every city every city has like two three of them what are those for the water towers so they must be doing something with the water right and you look in the in the bottom of the towers and like these huge pipes right they're like this wide so water goes up and then gushes down and there's water pumps that keep the water pump did i say pump like a heart is a what it's a pump right so it pumps the water to keep going so there's big pipes and they get smaller and they get smaller and they get to your house and they're like an inch right they're like that big the big ones are that big and they go into the house and they get even smaller half an inch does it sound like your arteries the aorta and then your arteries and then your arterioles and then your capillaries so why do we need because if there's no pressure that means your arteries dilate that means you have big pipes like this in your house right the little or the little pipes that we have in the house are the ones that make the pressure right of course the water pumps keep the water flowing to prevent bacteria from growing right and keep it going keep from rusting the pipes and all that stuff in your heart if your heart stops obviously you're dead but if there is the your arteries dilate they get wider is your blood pressure go up or down if your arteries dilate down yes your blood pressure drops because now the heart doesn't have to work that much so like oh yeah i get a break the arteries dilated but what if they constrict oh my god oh my god something's going on let me pump harder so the blood pressure goes up so the 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 fact that we have pressure in our circulation allows the organs to be able to get all the blood that they need your liver your kidneys your eyes your heart itself and every your skin So that is why your heart adapts to the blood pressure. Because of blood pressure. That's why it's important. If there's no blood pressure, you're going to be gone. You're going to have stagnant blood, you're going to get blood clots and all your organs are not going to get blood flow. So we give you extra fluids to bring up that blood pressure. We fill you up with like half a liter right away. We push it in as fast as we can to get it in you. through the IV. That's why when you go to the ER they put these huge IVs on you. Mm-hmm. Like the 18 gauge the green one and the pink one the fat ones. So we got because we can push a lot of blood, a fluid real quick like that. Medications, whatever kind of medication you need, beta blockers to help you relax. So uh, to help the heart and so on. Coronary angiography, like I said I mentioned earlier, right? If you are having a heart attack you're going to be taken to the um to the cath lab coronary angiography science science oh okay you want to second okay so you were rushed to the or somebody was rushed to the emergency room with a chest pain they did all the work up uh we need someone to do cardiac enzymes which is a phlebotomy work lab work we need someone to do an ekg a stat ekg a 12 lead ekg not just a regular 3 lead ekg but a 12 lead ekg uh the nurse will take care of the medic- medical treatment in case uh so this person needs uh, urgent care if they're determined to be having a heart attack right you see some st elevation or a non uh, st elevation heart attack on any of the leads they have to be referred to the cardiologist for uh, angiography coronary angiography is a study of the arteries and they take them You see the picture on page uh, 323. You see the the little cameras, the little circles. That's a camera as an x-ray of the arteries. 
they're doing a, uh, they stick the catheter usually to one of the main um, veins through their upper arm when they're bigger or sometimes through the right groin. I think they still do that. And they're going all the way to your to your heart and, and inject, inject the medication in the right atrium and it goes to your arteries right away because it's there, it's right there. So it flows through to your arteries and they take pictures. And that's what you're looking at, right? All the arteries in there. So and, the yeah, yeah, the x-ray machine, that one. Mm -hmm. And it shows, and it, uh, the arteries that are occluded, they'll look bumpy. Mm -hmm. There's will be like a little bolita, like a bump. Mm -hmm. So the doc cardiologist will determine, okay, this is uh, you know the left anterior descending or the circumflex or whatever artery is clogged, it's not allowing blood flow to go to this part, so we're gonna put a stent. Or maybe there's multiple and he needs um, a bypass graft. That's a problem. Uh, if it's just a little blood clot, they'll administer uh, antifibrolytics medications that will dissolve clots. Of course, that's dangerous because it just doesn't declot something there. It's go through your entire body. And you might have some hemorrhaging in your brain, hemorrhaging anywhere in your body that could cause more problems. So somebody has to sign the consent to take that risk. Do you want that fibro, fibro uh, uh, analytic uh, agent or medication? Or you might have angioplasty, which is repair of your arteries via stent. Stents, I already talked about stents, right? Mm -hmm. It should be performed within 90 minutes of the patient's arrival, no more than 12 hours after a heart attack. The problem with stents is that in the future, they get, um, they get uh, occluded again. The, all that pressure from the, from the walls of the arteries continues to build up on the stent and it continues to kind of grow into the stent because it's a little wire mesh and it occludes again. That's a problem with stents, but they do last a while. They can last a couple of years depending on the person. Or last uh, thing would be a bypass, coronary artery bypass graft. We call them cabbage, cabbage, like the vegetable, CBG. That's a replacement of your arteries, not replacement, but a bypass. For example, if you want to bypass traffic on the expressway, right? The, oh, there's an accident over there. I'm going to get off. You get off right away, right? On the ramp. And then you get on another next one. What did you do? You bypass the traffic. This is what happens here. If there's an artery that is occluded, they'll get some of the veins in your body. We have veins that are very big. They're kind of excessively long in the leg. I call the great saphenous veins. They're about this part on the this part of the leg, right on the upper part, and they they go in there, make a little cut, and they cut a long piece, right, and then they sew it back together, and then that extra piece, they're gonna put a wire in through the middle, and they invert it out because we have valves. Remember the valves mm -hmm. and the veins? Well, we cannot have valves in the heart, so we put it inside out. Okay, the smooth side is gonna be. In insight, so, huh? Yeah. So now the they say this is an um, I don't know. They say there's an artery from you to there, right? And there's occlusion here in the middle. Well, this vein is going to connect from here and then on the to pass the occlusion. No, leave it there. They leave it there. Yeah. So by a detour, right? So you're bypassing that that um that occluded part. So blood flow is gonna go. So veins work great because they're from your same body. So your body's not gonna reject it. But still, you have a risk of developing uh, little blood clots around there because they, they're different. So they give you a medication for the rest of your life. Or even if you have a stent, you're gonna have to take it. An anticoagulant like Coumadin or Warfarin, or now we have Eliquis and we have, I just remember Eliquis and, but there's more than that. There are anticoagulant medications that you have to take for the rest of your life. And uh, that would be the last one. Like I said, you can have one, two, three, four, five, right? Um, diseases of the left main coronary artery, the left main are the most dangerous. They, they call this the widow maker because you've left Widowmaker, that means that like guys you die, right? <laughs> that means ladies are widows. What do you call a man? A widow too, right? Oh yeah, they're called widows too. Anyways, 
Uh, yeah, if your left main corner artery is occluded, you're probably going to die because it's the main one that feeds the left ventricle, the left muscle. And if a lot of that muscle dies, well, then you're probably going to have a massive heart attack. Sudden death often refers to Widowmaker. Occlusion of this vessel will lead to death of the septum and the interior and lateral walls of the left ventricle. The septum, remember that, that muscle part that divides the ventricles. With subsequent left pump failure and death. So on page 326, you see an example of a stent being placed. Very, very small catheters, super small. I'm surprised when I saw it, I was like, that little thing's in it? How does that make it in there? They're very, very small. You see how it resumes up completely? Uh, oh, there's another procedure. It's not used much anymore. It's called uh, balloon angioplasty. Balloon is a repair uh, of the, well, balloon is a balloon, but angioplasty, repair the arteries. When the arteries get occluded because of the plaque, the balloon, they inflate it, and it pushes up the, the, the wall, right? So it opens. So that's like short term, because what happens when you take out the balloon, it comes back down. So they open it up with a balloon, they open the vessel, and then they insert the stent. It's kind of like um, support. That's what it is. So the balloon behind the stent? It's, uh, the stent is over the balloon. Or they insert the balloon first, they open the artery, and then they oh. put the mesh in, right? Yeah. They, they put the, but they have to inflate it first and then they insert the stent. People with um, heart failure over many long times, uh, there's something called Coumadin Clinic. Remember what Coumadin is? It's the anticoagulant medication, the one you have to do a PT and INR for. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why you do it for most reasons. Uh, Coumadin is old anticoagulant medication. Actually, Coumadin is, warfarin is the generic name for it. Warfarin is found in a rat poison. They, uh, it, if you look on the boxes, if you ever have a rat problem, um, the group, you know, nobody reason? only me, <laughs> I mean, I had a rat problem one time. They made a hole on the brick through one of the court, yeah, on the border. And I happened to find it by chance. Like, how in the heck did they get in here? I would look all over the place, you know, and your houses, if it's a brick house, it has little holes in the bottom, okay? Oh. Okay. Yeah, the grout, exactly. Wait, but you know, they get long, right? They might be short and chubby, but they stretch and they become like a sausage and they make their way through the through the hole. I was out there, we're fixing something else and I saw the holes like, what the heck? And I ended up, I covered it with cement again. And then uh, I bought rat poison. It's like a little house and they go in there, right? And they eat the poison. Oh, like the black one? Yeah, yeah, it works really good. Uh, so they go in there. The problem is that they can die inside the house and it's going to stink like a mother for a while. So hopefully uh, they say they get thirsty and they get out and they go to look for water and they hopefully they die out somewhere, but they bleed to death. That's how they die. Patients can also bleed to death. <laughs> so that's why we have to do PTI in ours. And that's why it's, uh, it, but the new medications are not as, as potent, I guess, as uh, Coumadin. So they don't require uh, this testing, like regular testing, like with Coumadin. So they don't have to go to Coumadin clinic anymore, but they do have to go to the heart failure clinic. There's clinics just for that. And that patient that I talked about earlier, he, he needs to go to the uh, heart, uh, heart failure clinic, like bad. All right, so. Well tolerated, there's so this, okay. We're pretty much done with this chapter. The last section I'm not gonna discuss because it's done. So, go ahead and work on the exercises. Uh, I would like to go and, you know, I'm gonna get, print out a couple of them so you can see what STMI looks like. Uh, ST elevation heart attacks and non-ST elevation heart attacks. This book does not talk about the deep cues, how to calculate them but uh, I have the other handouts that does explain it. How to calculate the deep cues. So this book fell a little bit short in that area. Okay, I'm gonna stop now.